Good morning, my beloved. May I just say I love you all with the love of the Lord. Thank you for those of you who prayed for me this week. The one thing you forgot to pray for is to, to ask the Holy Spirit to make my sermon a little bit shorter. So please forgive me if it is about five, hopefully three minutes longer than usual. Once in England we uh, had a, a Gideon visit to a church and there was a visiting preacher. So this guy preached and he preached. And in that church they, they have something which we don't find in all churches. The musicians know exactly when just to go to the piano and start playing very softly and so on. So when the pianist got behind the, the piano, the preacher saw it and he heard her playing, so he looked at his watch and then the pianist said, don't worry brother, preach it brother, preach it. So um, Ian, if you start playing the guitar softly and uh, you join him, Helen, where are you? I'll know that it's time to say amen. You know, this past week I was really under attack because the Lord laid this message on my heart and this past week the devil came and he said, hey, are you sure you delivering this message to the right church? Be very careful that you don't hurt people. Be very careful that you don't upset people. And I was really battling. <laughs> and yesterday, when Marina and I read from our Faith for Daily Living, I, I saw the date and, and it reminded me that it was my mother's date of birth. And when I saw that, peace came over my heart because, you know, my mom, oh, she walked with the Lord. She spent hours a day from four o'clock in the morning in the presence of the Lord. She always knelt down when she prayed. And she prayed out loudly. And I can remember early in the morning I woke and I heard my mother praying. And so often she said, Lord, search my heart. Erna, will you please come and do the reading? Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my downsitting and my uprising. You understand my thought afar off. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all, all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hides not from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you have formed my inward parts. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows right well. My frame was not hid from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes did see my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Surely you will slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloody men. For they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate you, 
And am not I grieved with those that rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This morning, on our way from Riversdal, there was a very powerful message over the radio. And the theme of his message was more or less, don't play with sin. As we are gathered here in the presence of the Lord, some, and I believe many, are experiencing the joy of victorious living. But there may also be those who look down with a thought, you know, to be honest, I don't really make it. Others may feel that they are in between. They have their highs and they have their lows. Yes, victorious Christian living is not easy. It does not just drop on your lap. It's hard work, but by God's grace it is possible and it can be, should be, a glorious reality in the life of Christians. If anybody feels right now that you are in, on a spiritual low, don't think you are the first and the only one. Also not the last one. Even in the Bible we read about people who battled in this instance. Even Paul, the prince of the apostles, cried out, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? In this struggle to do what is right. But it all ended victoriously. The question is why many Christians lack the joy of victorious Christian living. The answer lies in one single name, Satan. The cunning, sly, hypocritical prince of darkness. He's the problem. The master of deception who appears as the angel of light. The typical sweet-talking guy. Never trust him. Never underestimate his power. He couldn't be bothered about mediocre Christians. Hush, hush. In fact, he loves and he nurtures them, pretending that he is the only one that really understands and cares. But my dear friends, he passionately hates the reality of victorious Christian living. Christians who live victoriously by God's grace will constantly be under attack but he never attacks with a forceful bang. He attacks very gently. He is the sweet-talking comforter when the going gets tough. He knows all the soft spots and then very gently but cunningly sows seeds of doubt in our hearts. Softly and tenderly he whispers, Hey, you can't trust God. You can't really trust him. He promise, his promises are just too good to be true. And he then takes us by the hand and leads us down backsliders lane. The second thing he does is to blind us for the truth. He hates the truth because truth prevents him from having his way to destroy victorious Christian living. Now what is the truth? No, who is the truth? Jesus says emphatically, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we read, the truth will set us free. What then is the truth? The truth is that Jesus shed his blood, was nailed to the cross of Calvary, and in his dying moments he shouted out in victory, It is finished! And then, <laughs> low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign, not to lose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Yes, everybody is born in sin because of our sinful nature, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is mankind's biggest problem, but God is greater than mankind's biggest problem. 
The truth is, God so much loved the world that He gave His only Son so that nobody shall perish but have everlasting life. He is passionate about forgiveness. Isaiah 1 verse 18, No matter how deep the stains of your sin, I can remove it. I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you as white as wool. That's what my tie resembles. The blood of Christ on the cross makes me white as snow. Micah 7 verse 18 and 19. You cannot stay angry with your people forever. Because you delight in showing mercy, you will trample our sins under your feet and throw them in the depths of the ocean. And Umdristein, he always said, and take note, there's a little signboard, no fishing allowed. This, my beloved, is the truth. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. If you come to the Lord with your load of sin, know and believe He forgives and we are cleansed by His blood. Not halfway, but all the way. It's wiped out and He never remembers it again. Oh, take God on His unfailing word and to hell with Satan. The truth is John 1, 2. But to all who have believed Him and accepted Him, He gave the right to become children of God. And if you've prayed the sinner's prayer, you're a born-again child of God, and He longs to see you running the race of victorious Christian living. When I started teaching, we had the annual color sport day. And I remember the first event was the 50 meters for preschool girlies. You remember those? The parents cheered at the finish line. They ran into the arms of their dads and mums, and one dad threw his child up in the air, and when he caught her, he said, I heard him saying proudly, You've done it! You've done it! Beloved, God stands in the portals of heaven waiting for us to finish the race victoriously. The truth is that God wants us to live victoriously, but He gives us an indication that it is not going to be easy. The Word of God reminds us that only those who persevere to the end will be saved. Surely hard times lie ahead, and the going can get extremely tough. Think about Paul and Peter. Think about the persecuted church through the ages and up to this day. But the truth also lies in God's promises. Every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse in the line my mom always sang. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, But remember that the temptations that come into your life are not different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. What a promise. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you will not stagger under it. 2 Peter 2.9 So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials. James 4 verse 7 So humble yourself before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What a joy to see the devil on the run. And God makes it possible. I remind you of Paul's strong words in Romans 8 giving us the assurance that we are more than conquerors through Christ that strengthens us. Now the question arises, I know that I'm a child of God, I know my sins are forgiven, but why is it that I don't really experience victorious Christian loving? For me it seems that it just doesn't work out for me. My beloved, don't feel guilty and unworthy. Remember Paul, the prince of the apostles when he describes his spiritual battle in Romans 7 and 8. Do yourself a life-changing spiritual favor and study those two chapters. In chapter 7, verse 24, he cries out, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from the body of this death? And then there is victory in verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah! In Galatians chapter 5, he points out the battle between the spirit in us and our sinful nature. He also called the flesh. 
In verse 17 he writes, For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. And then in Galatians 6 verse 7 to 9, Paul warns, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature he will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit, he will reap eternal life. Let me put it this way. To live victoriously by God's grace is an act of your will. Like loving people is an act of your will. It just doesn't come from self. From, you see, let's say, where, uh, yeah, we have to choose either to be a pig Christian or a cat Christian. Let's say that mud represents sin. A pig loves and enjoys mud. He rolls over it. It's where he would like to be. He's quite happy and comfortable in mud. And the cat? Have you ever seen a cat landing in mud? He hates it. You can see it on his face. And then he gets out of the mud and his body language tells you how terrible. And then he licks the mud to clean himself. You see, that's the difference between a, f- the, a fleshy and a victorious Christian. You either roll in the mud or you do something to get out of it and cleanse by the blood. This reminds me of a story of, of the two dogs, the grandfather who had the two puppies, and his grandson asked him, Dad, I love these puppies, a black one and a, and a white one. When they grow up, do you think they'll fight? So he said, of course they will fight. And then the boy asked him, but granddad, who will win the fight? So he said, well, the one you feed. So if you feed the black dog, which is the flesh, then the flesh will win. If you feed the white dog, which is the saving grace and the cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ, then the light will win over the, the darkness. There is a serious blockage in the spiritual life of Christians if the flesh is not yet crucified. The day we pray the sinner's prayer and ask God to forgive, He does it in principle, but then the fierce battle against the flesh starts. That's what Paul and many Christians today experience. Now, what is the solution to this? Well, to get rid of the blockage. Take your flesh from day to day to the cross and let the Spirit take control and then listen to Him and obey. Obedience to the Holy Spirit paves the way to victorious Christian living. But take heed. The Holy Spirit is a gentle spirit. He doesn't enforce Himself upon you. In Hebrews 3 we are warned, verse 7 and 8, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert. Ephesians 4.30, under the heading, Living as Children of the Light, Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. During high school, on Christian Student Association, that CS fear for you, Alwyn, and all the other Afrikaans guys. On the camps, the late Um Driestein always reminded us not to, give the, to grieve the Holy Spirit. And he said, the Holy Spirit is like a little feather down. It hovers above your face, but with one, it's gone. What he meant was that a moment could be reached that the Holy Spirit is not heard any longer because our hearts are hardened. But if we surrender to the Spirit and allow Him to speak to us, something will happen in our hearts. While we were still in England, our pastor Phil Hill took about 20 of us on a trip to Israel. One of the highlights I very vividly remember is time we spent in a small place of worship on Mount Olive facing Jerusalem down below. Pastor Phil suggested we just bow down in prayer and wait upon the Lord. What a good thing to do. After a few moments of silence, he began to sing softly, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, 
fill me, use me. We joined him in singing softly but earnestly. Now then there was a silence and all of a sudden we started pouring our hearts out before the Lord, listening to the gentle voice of the Holy Spirit. And when we left the small church, we almost did it leaping and jumping because of our newfound joy in the Lord. Now let's go back to victorious Christian living. What is the hindrance, the obstacle that prevents Christians from experiencing the joy of the Lord in Christ? Among others, I want to point out two reasons. But it's not easy because it doesn't fall softly on the ear. It hurts. It upsets. In the first place, our uncrucified flesh and unconfessed sin in the flesh are major obstacles. Isaiah 59 from verse 1, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to, dull to the ear to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. And then he points out to the sins of the Israelites. In Psalm 66, 70, 20, I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. And then he says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Cherished sin. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise to be God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. As Ernest read Psalm 139 verse 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Allowing the Spirit to talk to our hearts followed by obedience can work spiritual wonders. Some years ago, I listened to the testimony of a pastor of a lively church. It wasn't a lively church for some years. He took his annual leave but had no rest because he knew something was wrong in his ministry. He decided to seclude himself from the daily activities to seek the Lord's face. And the only place he could think of was a small space behind the pipe organ where nobody would have found him and there was no telephone. After three days, he read Isaiah 59. And all of a sudden, he came under tremendous conviction of indwelling sin, obvious and secret sins. He said he sobbed before the Lord, confessing his sins as the Spirit pointed them out one by one. And then he left his secluded spot, spot freed and forgiven. And by God's grace, he could take his first step to victorious Christian living. And his church had a new pastor and a reason. And that was the reason for the now lovely, lively church. At the age of six, my mother led me to the Lord. And in her footsteps, I grew in faith and dedication. I made myself a catapult, a full rack. And one evening I did an unimaginable foolish thing. I aimed at the passing car and hit the target. Can you believe this, this Olika Oki did that? I waited for the next car again and I hit the target again. What I didn't know was that it was the same car. Our local mechanic owner of the car, turned back and rushed to our house and extremely upset, he fumed as he told my parents that somebody threw object at his car. I was, <laughs> I was the only suspect, but I emphatically denied that I did anything wrong. I blatantly lied again and again and thought I would get away with it. <laughs> I didn't. Three years later, I suffered with a terrible, unbearable guilt feeling. And when I attended a service and the preacher's topic was confessing sins of the flesh and restitution, if applicable, there was an altar call and desperately I almost ran forward. I asked God to forgive me my lies and immediately my peace was restored. My parents waited outside and I ran into their arms. I told them that I that it was me who shot at Uncle Ken's car and I asked them to forgive me lying about it. They joyfully forgave me. Then the next day, I couldn't wait to go to Uncle Ken, although I was scared. The next morning, I went to the garage and I expected the worst. He was looking for me for three years now. When I approached him, 
I was in tears. I couldn't utter a word. He put his arm around me and he said, It's okay. You're forgiven. Before I've even said that it was me who shot at his car. I knew it was you. And you did the right thing to put things straight. You're a brave boy. Well, I wasn't because the Holy Spirit prompted me. The greatest of all was that my peace and the joy in the Lord was restored. In the late 80s, I as a model father, so I regarded myself, bought my family a TV, which, by the way, I couldn't afford. At first it was great and my children needn't go to the neighbors to watch TV. A few years later, I, the model father, sensed that something went wrong. I called a family meeting and mentioned to them that I was worried about. You know, I'm the guy who, who gives all the lecturers about all the good things in life, the things that we should do. Hypocrite I was, actually. I waited patiently until Piet, some of you know him, had the guts to say, Dad, it's you and the TV. And when you return from work, you watch TV, and if we dare to say a word, you tell us to shut up. So we shut up and we go to our rooms. Rather sarcastically, my answer was, so then I will get rid of the TV set. Mm -hmm. And to my amazement, they all agreed. The next morning, I didn't sell it, I dumped it. And ever since, there hasn't been TV in my home. I dumped it. I didn't want anybody else to use it. I must admit, all those years... The TV, the TV wasn't the problem. I was the problem. Because unaware and selfishly I allowed TV to sneak in between me and my family. Now why do I tell you this incident? It brings me to the second obstacle in, to victorious Christian living. In Re Revelation chapter 2, John writes to the church in Ephesus. And that was not a small church, that was a main church. John writes to the church in Ephesus as it was revealed to him by the angel, You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you've not grown weary. Good for you. Yes, I hold this, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the heights from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did first. Repent and do the things that you did first. And if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. He ends the letter with a sound advice and a marvelous promise. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. There are several reasons why Christians forsake their first love. We could draw up a list. Worldly pleasure, secret sins, getting involved with important secular matters, chasing wealth and fame, just to mention some. But let us not be unaware of the most dangerous one, I believe. The thriving, unstoppable technology explosion. We must be very cautious. Today, technology destroys one of the most important and precious aspects of life, relationships. Everyday relationships between us and our relationship with the Lord. Recently I read a letter written by a heartbroken woman to a marriage counselor and she wrote desperately, Can you please help me? Our once happy marriage is on the rocks. My husband, whom I love passionately, got addicted to smartphone games. He plays into the early morning hours, and when I begged him for some time to spend together, as it always was, he was furious, left the bedroom, and has now moved to the spare room, and we hardly ever speak to each other. Please help me. That's bad, eh? A man who has forsaken his first love, as far as it concerns a once precious marriage. Not so long ago, we went to friends supposedly for Bible study, starting at 7 o'clock. When we arrived just in time, we found dear Christian friends, smartphones in their hands, sharing the latest hilarious video clips and jokes. 
40 minutes later, somebody remembered there was still a Bible study. Needless to say, the Bible study was an, an anti-climax. During our recent holiday up north, speaking to pastors and friends, I came to the shocking conclusion that prayer meetings, Bible studies, and evening times of worship with something of the past, and soapies and reality programs on TV has taken over. Pastors are losing the battle against Seven de Laan, Binnenlanders, Getrouwd met Rugby, Masterchefs, Noot vir Noot, Sport, and all the others. From the pulpit, they see how people start using their smartphones. Dust-covered Bibles and shiny smartphones on, and laptops tells a story. Glorious, eternal, life-giving biblical apps are pushed aside and ignored and people can't wait for the latest smart app available. And they pay for it. And the biblical apps, they get for nothing. My beloved, don't misunderstand me. Modern technology is a mind-boggling gift if used for the right purpose. Every brilliant brain and invention is a gift from God. But when the invention gets bigger than the giver, we've got a problem. What shall we do then? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. See if there is any offensive way in me and if the Holy Spirit convicts us of any indwelling and perhaps secret sin that separates us from God don't grieve the Holy Spirit take it to the cross where God forgives and forgets he is faithful and true to cleanse us from all unrighteousness All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me Jesus, take me now. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Victorious Christian living, my beloved, is God's desire for all his cleansed, blood-cleansed children. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts. You know us. Thank you for the joy we have in you. And please help us not to allow the Satan, this cunning, sly, sweet-talking guy, to get us away from you. Lord, someone has once said, if we come in your presence, we don't march in. We fall on our faces before you. And Lord, we don't want to come and say how good we are. We just want to come and say, Lord, work in our hearts. Cleanse us, purify us, and make us somebody who will mean something in your kingdom here until you return. Amen.